If he throws the ball, there's not a chance it'll be incomplete. But then you see that exact same person turn right around, and as they say, you couldn't hit the water if you fell out of a boat, or you couldn't hit the sand if you fell off your camel. There's no chance of him scoring. His confidence is down, and he's what we call a slump. And tonight I want to talk and I want to ask is sometimes we find ourselves in these spiritual slumps. We find ourselves asleep for the Lord. And you know, something, it's something that I believe that each and every one of us will have to deal with if we haven't already. If you're young and you haven't faced this point, something that you need to be prepared for is because at some point you'll probably face a slump or you'll face a sleep in Christianity or sleep in your life. Now, the first thing I think we need to do is kind of think about why I'm in a slump. Why am I falling into a slump? And I think the number one reason, the number one reason for in me in my life would be spiritual immaturity. Spiritual immaturity. Oftentimes we look at spiritual maturity or spiritual growth as a destination rather than as a process. We look at it as something that we, we've grown a little bit since we were baptized. We've studied our Bible and we've We've come to the point where we're no longer the one who has to ask all the questions. People have started asking us questions. Not the same or the same temptations that used to bother us. They don't still affect us today. We've grown, so we're doing pretty well. And then we stop growing. We either stop studying our Bible or we stop praying and we stop challenging ourselves to become better every day. We think of it as a destination rather than a process. When we become immature and we stop growing. Another way I heard it said was you do the best you can, or sorry, the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, you do better. You know, the Hebrew writer acknowledges the fact that some of us are going to start, or all of us will start, on the milk. We're all going to start on the simpler things in the, in the scriptures and the gospel, and we're not going to know everything. You turn to me to Hebrews, the fifth chapter, we'll, we'll start in verse 12. Hebrews the fifth chapter, starting in verse twelve, we can see that he acknowledges the fact that we're not all going to start at the same point. We're not all going to start out spiritually mature. We're not all going to start out on the harder things, of, the harder, harder things of um, of scripture and understanding. But we all have a responsibility to grow. Verse twelve says, "For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need to be someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food." For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full age, that is, when we are reason, uh, by who reason of use, and have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Starting in verse, chapter 6 says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of, faithful, uh, and of faith towards God, of doctrine, of baptisms, of laying on hands, of resurrection from the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. We have a responsibility to grow, and if we're not growing, and if we find ourselves in a rut, a lot of times it's because we're standing still. You know, it's oftentimes said, and my football coach told us just about every day, if you're not getting better, then you're getting worse because there's no such thing as staying stagnant. We continue to get worse if we're not improving. Another thing that might cause us to be in a slump would be unfulfilled expectations. Unfulfilled expectations. I don't know how many uh, people came, came to the church and were thinking, you know what, everything's going to get easier for me. These temptations that I fight with, these struggles that I have, when I become a member of the church, they're not going to bother me anymore. Everything's going to become easier. Everything's going to come better. And then once you're here for a little while, you realize, you know what? Just because I'm a member of the church doesn't mean every single problem that I have in my life goes away. Just because I'm a member of the church doesn't mean that every sickness that I ever have, every trial that I ever have, is going to go away and our, our expectations are unfulfilled and that puts us in a slump. It puts us in a little bit of a rut. The number three thing would be the failure to spend time in our Bible. Failure to spend time in our Bible. This goes back to our spiritual growth. If we're not in our Bibles, studying and learning about the Scripture, studying and learning about what God wants us to do in His will, then we're not going to grow. We're going to find ourselves at a point where we become spiritually bored or spiritually asleep because we're no longer being challenged. We're learning the exact same things or we're stuck in the exact same things for however many years of our life. And when there's no growth, we fall asleep. 
So three things we've talked about are failure to spend time in the Bible, unfulfilled expectations, and spiritual immaturity. The last one we're talking about this morning is pro- or this evening is problems at home. You know, a lot of times problems at home can affect it and might not have anything to do with what's going on at the church. Maybe we've got financial issues at home. We're having trouble making payments or we're having trouble getting going week to week on our paycheck. Maybe we're having fights with our spouse and they continue to get worse and we just don't see an end to it. That puts us in a slump because we're just not seeing an end. It doesn't seem to be getting better. Or maybe you're in the situation where you've got a spouse that won't attend to you with you. You've got a spouse that is not a believer. And that becomes discouraging. And when that becomes discouraging and it continues to drag you down and drag you down, oftentimes you'll stop growing. You'll find yourself in that slump. You'll find yourself in that rut. And that's something that's hard to get out of. Something that's really hard to get out of. And these are all very common reasons for a Christian to fall asleep. To fall asleep at the wheel. And oftentimes it's a whole lot harder to get out of that slump than it is to get in it because a lot of times I think we don't really fully realize they're out we're in a slump. And nobody around us fully realizes that we're in a slump to, to help pull us out. Because we're, when we're in a slump, typically we're going to be here every single Sunday, we're going to be here every single Wednesday, and we're not going to be missing a beat. We're going to be doing maybe our Bible lessons. We're going to be here and we'll be singing, we'll be studying. But we just don't feel like God is close. We feel like maybe God is in the distance. You know, I heard it said one time that when you're on fire for the Lord, people will come from miles around to watch you burn. So the question is, is your faith, is your fa- are you still so hot that people are coming around you and they're getting warm themselves? Is your faith still contagious? Because if it's not, the chances are you're in a slump. Or when people come around you, are they getting cold because of the cool, how cool you are? If you answered yes to either of those, then chances are you're in a slump. If God feels distant, if it feels like your trials may never end, and there's no way to get out of it, and there's no encouragement, chances are you're asleep. You know, the Bible gives us a good example, and we thank Jalen for reading. If you go back to the 13th Psalm with me, I think right here we find David to have fallen into a slump, and he seems to be struggling at this time in his life. In the 13th Psalm, starting in verse 1, it says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed against him. Lest those who have troubled me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. David is struggling at this point. David has found himself in a little bit of a slump, don't you think? This is great David, a man that was considered to be after God's own heart. Someone we look at being such a great man of faith. But he seems to be struggling. He says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? He's wondering, God, where are you? God, you seem so far away from me. Where are you? But there's very, three very distinct things that David does in this, in this uh, chapter, in this psalm, that I think is a great example and are things that we need to follow. And the first thing he did is he prayed to God and he pleaded to God. Starting in verse 1 again, it says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Verse 3 says, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed against him. Lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. He said, God, please. God, enlighten me. I'm struggling. I feel like I'm in a rut. I can't get out of this rut alone. God, show me what I must do. God, show me the way to get out. And that's something that I think is very important. This very first thing that we need to do when we're struggling is plead to God. Turn to God and ask Him for His help. Turn with me to 121st Psalm. We're going to spend a lot of time looking at different Psalms, most of them by David, a few not. Because this helps us. There's a lot that helps us as we go throughout this study. The 121st Psalm.
And it says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade of the right hand. The sun shall never strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve you going out and, and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Isn't that something that's so encouraging to read? That when we're struggling, when we're lost and we go to God, we know that He's right there. God is the help of those who seek Him. Verse three again, verse four, or verse three. Sorry, it says, "He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not sleep." God doesn't fall asleep on us. We might fall asleep on God. We might find ourselves in a slump, but God is always there. God is always there, and God's always awake and ready to help us if we'll just reach out to Him. If we will just go to Him. Second Corinthians, the thirteenth chapter, and verse four. If you'll turn with me there, that's the next passage we'll read. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, in verse 4. God is always there. It says, For though He was crucified in weakness, yet He lives by the power of God. For we are also weak in Him, but we shall live with Him by the power of God towards you. When we're weak, we can live with Him through the power of God. We've got a God who's always ready to help us. We've got a God who not only is ready to help us, He will help us when the time comes and He will show us the way out of our slump. But the first thing we have to be willing to do is turn to Him. The first thing we have to be willing to do is actually go to Him and ask Him, God, please enlighten me, as David said. God, please show me the way. If we go to God, He'll answer. And if we go to God, He'll show me the way out and He'll pull me through. But that's not where it stops. It doesn't just stop with going to God. We must be willing to go to work. We have to go to walk God, and then we have to go to work. You know, a lot of times it seems like God is telling us no. God's saying, no, I'm not going to pull you through that slump. Because I might pray to God, and I might ask Him, God, please help me out. God, please show me the light. And we don't see it. We don't see the way out. And I think too often times it's because we're not actually looking. We're not actually willing to hold up our end of the deal. We're not actually willing to get to work. God doesn't just show us or tell us exactly what to do. He doesn't show, send us some big billboard sign that says, Nick, go this way, do this, and you'll get through. But what He does do is give me His Scripture. And if I'm willing to work and if I'm willing to look and if we're willing to show that we're willing to put effort into getting through, God will show us the way. So what kind of work do we have to do? First thing, we've already talked about a few things. We need to get studying through our Bibles. We need to get to our Bibles. 2 Timothy 2.15 is Scripture we oftentimes reference as study. Study to show thyself approved. Be diligent to show thyself approved. Usually our slumps are either partially or fully due to a lack of Bible knowledge. To a lack of getting in the Scriptures and studying them because as we said earlier, you kind of just fall into a rut and get bored. You know, we talked about the Hebrew writer talking about how some people are stuck on the milk. If I get stuck on the milk, and if I'm staying there for a long time, it's going to get a little boring, is it not? Because you're learning the same things. Well, maybe you've gone on to, let's say, the mashed potatoes. You got a little bit better. But then you stay there. You stay there and you're not continuing to grow and there's still room for growth. We're going to hit a rut. We're going to fall asleep because at some point it's going to get boring to listen to the same old thing. Our body's going to shut down and we're not going to be encouraged. We have to continue to grow, continue to challenge our mind and stay in our Bibles and study. I know I've preached a sermon here talking about that pie chart. We talk about the pie chart that is our life and every little thing that we do fills a piece of the pie. It fills a piece of what we're doing. We might have a work that counts for eight hours. We might have getting ready in the morning that counts for an hour. And after we do every little thing that we do in our day, our pie chart starts to get full. And sometimes we leave a little sliver for God or sometimes it gets pushed out completely. You know, and as we, that might be the wrong way to look at it as in God shouldn't just have a piece. Now while God should have a separate piece and he should, you should be willing to give Him a piece out of every day to study, to pray, and to go to Him, 
God should be in every single piece of our lives. We should be making God a part of every bit of our lives and glorifying Him in everything that we do. And if we do, it's going to be hard to fall in this slump. If God becomes a part of every part of my life, then it'll be hard to fall asleep. And the second thing we need to do is start growing again. And these two again go hand in hand. If we stop on the milk, then we're going to fall in that rut. If we're not grow, if we're not growing, we're not getting better. We have to study. We have to pray. We have to get through this trial, this trial that we're in, with God. Oftentimes, we're stuck in this trial. We're stuck in this temptation or whatever is causing this rut, and we try to get through it on our own. We try and get through it without God, and that's a lot of the issue. If we're willing to turn to God and have Him help us pull us through, if, we're supposed to, if we do it His way, we will grow. We also need to be learning from those who are around us. Learn from those who are either older or learn from the mistakes of others. And when we see the great examples that we have or even the bad examples we have, they can help us to grow. We need to get back into studying our Bibles and start growing again. But the first thing David did was he pleaded to God. That's something that I think it's important for us to take note of and look at and follow the example of. When we're stuck in any kind of life situation, or we're stuck in any kind of life struggle, the very first thing we need to do is turn to God. Ask God for His help. Ask God to show us the way. But then we must be willing to go to work. We must be willing to do our part to get through it. Now, if you want to turn back with me to 13th Psalm, we're going to look at the second thing, thing that David did. In Psalm 13, in verse 5, it says, But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. It says, but I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. So not only did he go to God, not only did he plead to God for help, second thing he did was he trusted God to fix it. He trusted God to be there and to have mercy on him. And that's something that's incredibly important for us to remember. You know, God had gotten David through so much in his life, had he not? Should a little boy David be able to beat Goliath? I think the simple answer is no, is it not? But then when he has God on his side, when God is with him, he can defeat any trial. So he's beat here, he's defeated lion and bear. What's this giant? Or we look at Saul trying to kill him. God got him through. And all the battles that David fought, God was there to help him through. David trusted in God because he had seen all the things that he'd done for him before. It's important for us to remember, first off, that God can pull us through any trial. If you look at 1 Corinthians 10.13, a scripture that just about anyone can knows what it says, or at least can give us a um, synopsis of the verse, it says, No temptation has overtaken you, such which is common to man. No temptation has te overtaken you, such which is common to man, but God is faithful. If there is a way, if there is a way or into this, God can get us through it. If God brings you to it, He'll bring you through it in every situation. There's always a way of escape for us. God will get us through any trial that we might be in. And the second thing we have to remember is to trust in, if we trust in God, He'll give us strength in the end. We have to trust that He'll get us through the trial, and we have to trust that in the end, He'll give us strength. Turn with me to James. In James, the first chapter, James is talking about the trials that we might have to face. He talks about some of the bad things we'll have to face and how it might be hard for a certain time. But then again, he also talks about the good. We're going to look specifically at verse 12, and then we'll bounce back up here in a second. It says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Isn't that something that's so encouraging? When I get out of this trial, when I get out of this slump, there's a crown of life waiting for me. There's glory waiting for me. Romans 8 and verse 18 says that the glory that will be revealed in us, or the, the trials that we're going through, are not worthy to be compared 
to that glory that would be revealed in us. Isn't that such a beautiful thing? Let's start up in verse, verse 2. and We're going to read this portion of Scripture. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Count it all joy when I fall into trials. You know, when people start making fun of me or saying that I'm wrong or ridiculing me because for the younger people, maybe you're missing practice to go to Wednesday night service. Or maybe you're making a stand against some of the recent, some of the recent uh, rulings that we've had in this country. And someone says you're wrong. Someone says that you're, you're hateful. Someone says that God's not with you because God loves everyone. That's good. It's good for me to get made fun of. It's good for me to be brought down. Let's keep reading. It says in verse there's 3, it says, Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Verse 3 and 4 kind of show us why it's good. It shows us why it's good to go through these temptations. It's good for us to go through these trials and these issues that we're having. Because the testing of our, patience, or our faith produces patience. And that once we've been tested and once we get through, we're getting closer and closer to perfection. We're getting closer and closer to perfection. Isn't that something that we're supposed to be striving for every day? Isn't that something that as Christians we're supposed to be looking for every day is becoming perfect? You know, Hebrews chapter 6 and the, the first verse where we looked earlier said, let us go on to perfection. Let us go on. Let us move on from the milk and go on towards perfection. Verse 5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is like a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. This says again, go to God. If you're struggling, you don't have wisdom, you don't know what to do, turn to God. Ask God what to do because He's given us a book full of wisdom. He's given us something to turn to where we can know exactly what He wants us to do in the situation. Verse 9 says, Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with the burning heat that it withers in the grass, and its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man will also fade away in his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he is approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He Himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when the desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and comes down from the Father of lights, from whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own he will be brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be kind in the first fruits of his creatures. These temptations that we have, they're not coming from God. They're not coming. These trials are not coming from God, and we can turn to Him. Verse 14 and 15 again says, "By one, each one is tempted when he is drawn away by what? By his own desires. By his own desires." And Titus 15 says, "Then when his desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. Sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Our desires and are those things that entice us or what cause us to sin." You know, Psalm 119, verse 11 says, Your word I put in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And if we're studying in our Bibles and if we're trying to grow each and every day and we're putting that word in our heart, if we're putting that word in our heart, then we're going to have less of those sinful desires. Then what's going to be in our heart is going to be God's word, not sinful desires. You must trust in God to give you strength in the end. We also remember that God will never, God will never leave our side. Turn with me back to Deuteronomy, the 31st chapter. Deuteronomy, the 31st chapter, and we'll read verse 6. It says, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them, for the Lord your God, He is the one who goes with you. 
He will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, He is one and who loves you, and who, sorry, who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. That's encouraging, isn't it? That God who has gotten Israel through all of these times before, who's gotten them through all the times that they've been in battle, this God who has helped them out of captivity, who has been with them from day one, He's still there today. And you know what? We still serve that same God. We still serve that same God who pulled the Israelites out of Egypt. We still serve that same God who kept His promise to Israel. We serve that same God who helped David defeat Goliath. Who helped Daniel in the lion's den. We, help, we serve that same God who sent His Son to die on the cross to wash away our sins. And that God has not changed. That God will not change and He'll always be by our side. He'll always be there with us as we go through these trials and as we go through these slumps and as we fall asleep. God doesn't leave. God will never leave our side. Turn with me to 23rd Psalm. 23rd Psalm, one of us that, or one that's very common to, to everyone here. Verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the, sh- the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me and that all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Verse 4, he says, Yea, though I walk through the, sha- the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. As we go through our trials, as we go through our temptations, as we might struggle in this life when we fall asleep, can we say the exact same thing that David said here? Although I'm going through this, Although I'm going through these struggles, although sometimes life isn't going to seem so grand, I know you're there. I know you're there and I know that you're with me and I won't be scared. I won't struggle because you're there. We must trust that God can get us through any trial. We must trust that God will give us strength in the end. We must trust that He'll always be by our side. And up to this point, we've seen that David has both seen, or first off, he went to God and he prayed to Him, pleading for help. And then second, we see that he trusted in God to help him. He trusted in the mercy of the Lord. And the third thing, if you'll turn back with me to the 13th Psalm, we'll read verse 6. It says, I will sing to the Lord because He has dealt bountifully with me. I will sing to the Lord for He has dealt bountifully with me. David praised God. David praised God. Which kind of seems a little crazy, doesn't it? A few verses earlier, he's saying, God, where are you at? God, where are you? I haven't seen you. I can't find you. Have you turned your face from me? Have you forsook me forever? How long will this go on? But then he turns and says, God, you're so good. He serves and he sings praises unto God. It kind of seems like the far off idea for us. It kind of seems like something that doesn't make any sense. When my life's bad, I should rejoice. When my life's bad, I should praise God. That's exactly what David did. Turn to the 77th Psalm. This is the one that's not by David, but it still pulls good application. Psalm 77 Starting in verse 1, it says, I cried out to God with my voice, and to God er, to God with my voice, and he gave ear to me. In the day of my trouble I sought the Lord. My hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. 
I meditate within my heart and my spirit makes diligent search. He said, God, I can't even sleep. I can't be comforted. My soul refuses to be comforted. The psalm writer seems to be going through a pretty hard time. He can't sleep. He says that he can't speak. And he feels that his soul can't be comforted. Verse 7 says, For the Lord casts off forever. And will He be favorable no more? Has His mercy ceased forever? Has His promise failed forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has He in anger shut up His tender mercies? That's pretty extreme, isn't it? For you to think that God is favorable no more, that His mercy has been shut off, you must be going through a pretty hard time. But then verse 10 He says, and I said, this is my anguish, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will also meditate on all your work and talk of your deeds. Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God? Who is so great a God as our God? Verse 14 says, You are God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the peoples. You have with your arm redeemed your people, the son of Jacob and Joseph. The water saw you, O God. The water saw you. They were afraid. The depths also trembled. The clouds poured out water. The sky sent out a sound. Your arrows are flashed about. The voice of your thunder was in the world. When the lightnings lift up the world, the earth trembled and shook. Your way was in the sea, your path in the great waters. And your footsteps were not known. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. He said, God, right now, I can't see any good out of this situation. He's in such a low point, he's starting to wonder, has God stopped being good? Has God dried up all His mercy? Is He no longer gracious? That's a pretty low point, don't you think? But he says, God, I'll remember. God, I will remember all the good that you've done. I'll remember all the good that you've done in the past and all the great you've done for us. Sometimes that's hard for us to do. That when we're in this low point, when we're in a rut, to think about all the good that God does in our life. To think about all the blessings that He's given us. You know, something that we need to work on, and I'm talking to myself especially, is when we're in this low point, turn to God and praise Him. Turn to God and praise Him. Tell Him how wonderful, tell Him how magnificent and awesome He is. Because all the blessings He gives us in our life. You know, it said that you can't list out all of your blessings because you'd run out of paper. You know, if I, if I tried to sit down and pray for all my blessings, I'd probably be late for work today and tomorrow and the next day, and Aunt Sean would probably fire me. I wouldn't be late, I just wouldn't be there because I'd be praying all day. Because God gives us so many blessings. God gives us so many blessings and when we're at this low point, as hard as it is to see, He's there. And He's still blessing us through those times. Let's consider Job for just a second. Turn to the first chapter of Job. We all know the story of Job. It's kind of like God is having a little competition with Satan saying, you know what? Job is faithful. Job is a good guy. And he's not going to curse me. And Satan says, you take that hedge down, I promise you, that guy is going to curse you. And at the end of chapter 1, Job's already lost all his property. Job's already lost all his children. In verse 20, he says, Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head. And he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he fell to the ground and worshipped, and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed, Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, David has just lost everything he had. He lost his his children. He lost his property, and he said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. He worshipped him. You know, oftentimes we'll find a time where we lose something or we we maybe get in a little bit of a car accident, we we are caught we're not gonna have a car anymore, or maybe something gets stolen from us, or maybe even we get in that unfortunate situation that nobody really should have to go through. 
Maybe we do lose a child. Or we lose a brother or a sister. Maybe we lose a parent at a very young age. Is our first reaction to praise God? Is our first reaction to turn to God and say, Blessed be Your name. To say, God, You are so good. Because that's exactly what Job did in this situation. He said, God, naked I came from my mother's room. Naked I shall return there. The Lord gave. The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then we look at chapter 2, verses 9-10. through 10. And it said, Then his wife said to him, Do you not still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. This is his wife. It says, Curse God and die. But look at verse 10. He said, But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept for adversity? In this time, Job did not sin with his lips. You know, oftentimes we're willing to accept all the good that God has given us. We're willing to accept all the good God has given us, and when things are good, we're willing to say, God, thank you so much. Thank you for this new promotion. I'm so thankful that I was able to buy this new car. I'm thankful for the opportunities you've been giving me. And then something goes wrong, and we're no longer thanking God. We're no longer thanking God for the opportunities and all the good things He still gives us in our life. Because as much as it seems like everything's going bad, there's still blessings all around us. God is still giving us blessings every single day. And like Job, we need to worship Him. Like Job, we need to say, God, You are so good. God, I know that this time is hard and I know that I'm struggling, but I know that You're there. And I know that You'll help get me through. We need to be willing to thank God for the good that He's given you. In this 13th Psalm, David did three things that really helped me and hopefully helped you realize just what we need to do to pull out of a slump. To, appear, to wake up from a spiritual slumber. First thing he did was pray to God and then he acted. He prayed to God and then he was willing to act. And that's something that we all need to do. Not only pray to God, go to Him, which would be the very first thing that we do is turn to Him and say, God, please help me. Enlighten my eyes, just as David said. We need to be willing to act. You know, you remember the passage of Scripture where, where Jesus is talking and He says, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. And He says that about ten different times in this, in this short little section of Scripture. But one of the things He says, You who wash the outside of the cup, but not the inside. You know, when you're doing dishes, we had to do dishes for lunch today, and I can tell you I'd have gotten in a lot of trouble if I did this. When you wash the dishes, do you just wash the inside, or we'll start with the other way. Do you just wash the outside and consider it clean? No. What about the other side? Do you just wash the inside and you don't notice the difference on the outside? I can tell you I would have been sent back and had to do all the dishes again this afternoon if I would have done that. But then when your company comes over and you hand them, don't worry. The dish is clean on the inside. Don't worry about all the dirt on that outside. Do you tell them that? The answer is no. And it works both ways. If we're cleaning the outside, if we're cleaning the outside, not the inside, it doesn't work. But if we clean the inside, the outside's, outside's bound to get clean too. If we clean the inside, we're going to clean the outside too. We're going to make a difference and we're going to make a change. You know, I don't know how many people are into working out. I know that's kind of on out phase because it's not January. But when we put on a few extra pounds and we're like, all right, it's time to get rid of that. So we start working out again. You know, for the first maybe two or maybe even three weeks, nobody says anything to us, do they? If we don't tell them that we started working out, nobody says a word to us. They don't say, you know what, you look like you've lost some weight. Or if you've been lifting, you look pretty good. No one really says that to us, do they? And it can kind of be the same thing in our spiritual life because when we're in a slump, usually we're here. Usually we're studying our Bibles. Usually we're answering questions in class and we look like everything's okay. Nothing really looks different about us. When we're making that change on the inside, it's going to take a little bit for people to notice that this guy's on fire again. That this guy's different. When we go back to lifting, we kind of get... After a few weeks, no one notices. But then once maybe that month hits, or maybe a month and a week hits, people start noticing there's a difference. 
Once you've cleaned out that inside, because your body from the very first time you pick up a weight is changing. Your body on the inside is changing, but at some point that outside is going to reflect it. That outside is going to show that I'm different, and it's the same way with our spiritual life. If we're cleaning out that inside, if we're cleaning out that inside, in the end, people are going to notice that we're on fire again. You said at the beginning, people will come for miles around to watch you burn. People will come and your, your, your faith will become contagious again. Your faith will be, will be seen again by other people. It won't just be the people that are at services with you who don't realize that there's something different. Those people that are maybe go to work with you or go to school with you will realize there's something different about that guy. We have to pray to God that we got to be willing to act. And then we must trust that God will make a difference. Trust that God will be willing to make the difference in our life and that He will be there to help us. That He'll get us through any trial, through any temptation, and He'll never leave our side. Pray to God and act. Then trust in God to do what we need. Trust in God and He will get us through. The third thing we need to be willing to do is praise God even when we seem like we're at our darkest. Praise God when it seems like there's nothing to be of praise for because I promise God is still blessing you even when we can't see it. Even when we struggle to see it because it's all the little things that we take for granted, God is still blessing us. And if we're willing to do these three things when we fall into a slump, when we fall into or we fall asleep, then we're going to get out of it. We have to be willing to pray the knack. You know, you talk about a basketball player, oftentimes they'll say, shoot your way out of the slump. Is that something that we need to do? If we're in a slump, there's probably something that we're doing wrong. If we've fallen asleep, there's something that we've do, done wrong. So you don't just keep doing what you're doing. We have to make a change and we have to make it in, a tr in our heart. Trust in God and praise Him. And if we do these things, then it's going to be nearly impossible or impossible to stay asleep and to stay in a slump. You know, maybe today you, you're here and you've, uh, you've been baptized, you've become a Christian, but you have fallen asleep. You've fallen asleep in that, and you're struggling to get out. You have the opportunity today to fix that or start that process. To sit in your pew and say to God, please help me. Please help me to wake up. Please help me to get out of this slump and lighten my way. And God will help you. God will be there to show you how to get out. Or maybe you have a sin of a public nature. Maybe your slump is more public and you just can't do it alone. Maybe you need the help and the prayers of the congregation. You also have that opportunity to do that tonight. To come forward and ask for the prayers of the congregation and to, to publicly confess the sins of your life. And you can also do that tonight. But maybe you haven't started that walk. Maybe you haven't started down the walk of being a Christian and you've not put on Christ in baptism, tonight we also have the opportunity to do that. We also have the opportunity, opportunity that the baptistry is ready, the water is ready, it's warm, and tonight you can put on Christ in baptism. I know I say it every single time, but don't leave this building this evening. Don't leave this building this evening with any kind of doubt. With any kind of doubt whatsoever, that we're going to spend an eternity in heaven. With any kind of doubt whatsoever that we won't spend our eternity with God. Because if you have that doubt, if you're not looking forward and excited for the day of judgment, then we need to make a change. We need to make that change right now. Because we're not guaranteed another hour. We're not guaranteed another day, another minute. Or really, we're not even guaranteed that next second. I plead with you to make that change in your life. To make that change right now as we stand and as we sing. What can we